Hello and welcome back to the final video of the Lambda Cube Unboxed. Throughout the last videos, we explored the Lambda Cube and all systems contained in it. We talked about their formal definitions, computational power, advantages and shortcomings. A very important application that we haven't touched on so far is intuitionistic logic. Especially weak omega and lambda p play a very important role when it comes to this approach. The correspondence between the lambda calculi and logic is generally referred to as propositions as types, PAT for short. At the same time, PAT also stands for proofs as terms and is one of the most fascinating correlations in mathematics and computer science. Every lambda calculus defines a mathematical system, but not only that, each calculus also corresponds to a type checking system and to a unique logical system. This enables us to look at the same problem from four different perspectives and use the advantages of every single one of them. So the basic idea of propositions as types is to prove a proposition from intuitionistic logic by deriving a statement in a lambda calculus. This looks as follows. Whenever we have a legal statement M is of type sigma, the type sigma represents some proposition P. And every term, like M, which inhabits this type is a proof for that proposition. Of course, there may be more than one term with type sigma. This is intuitive since one proposition can be proven in many different ways. But in all systems of the lambda calculus, we showed that the uniqueness of type lemma holds in one way or another, up to conversion for example, which guarantees that one term only has one type. So one specific proof can't show two completely arbitrary propositions. These proofs are not proofs in the classical sense. So there's no sentences and explanations but rather a sequence of terms put together via derivable conclusions. How such a proof works and what it might look like will be for us to discover in this video. In the PAT approach, we then work with the correspondence. The proposition P is true if and only if the corresponding type sigma is inhabited. This might already give an intuition as to why inhabitation is undecidable in systems with a more sophisticated type system like lambda C. There's no algorithm or general method to prove or disprove an arbitrary mathematical theorem. If inhabitation was decidable, we could formulate the theorem in the lambda calculus, and we could then use the algorithm for inhabitation to check whether the proposition is true or not. But then we would have found a general method to prove or disprove a proposition, and this would lead to a contradiction. Propositions can be formulated with logic. One of these logics is first order logic. It's definable with lambda c and we're going to explore this construction as a last example in this video series. First order logic, also known as predicate logic, is a formal language in which propositions are expressed in terms of predicates and quantifiers over variables. If you're unfamiliar with logic, or in particular first order logic, we recommend that you read up on that topic before watching on. We will mainly do a quick reminder of the definition and we're not going to go into that much detail. Every formula of first order logic can be formed inductively in the following manner. Firstly, there are terms, elements and values of function application. Atomic formulas of predicate logic are the predicates containing terms. And given some formulas, we can either quantify over element variables or use the classical logical connectives, negation, conjunction, disjunction, and implication to form more complex formulas. In classical logic, implication, one of or and and, and one of the quantifiers don't need to be defined, as they can be constructed from the other with the help of negation. The existential quantifier can be replaced as follows. Exists x phi of x can be expressed by not for all x, not phi of x. And a implies b can be replaced by not a or b. Lastly, a and b can be defined as not, not a or not b. However, the lambda calculus corresponds to the set of first-order definable formulas, not in classical logic, but only in intuitionistic logic. In intuitionistic logic, one insists that for any true statement A or B, there must exist a proof which of A or B holds such that the statement is true. It's not sufficient to show that one of them is true, but we need to know which one. Or even more so for a statement, there exists an X such that P of X holds. If this statement is true, then we must know an object t for which p of t actually holds. So in intuitionistic logic, for any true statement, there has to be a constructive proof. 
Because of that, intuitionistic logic is also called constructive logic. This logic differs from classical logic only by not containing the following two rules, the law of excluded middle and the double negation elimination. The law of excluded middle says that A or not A is true for every proposition A. But this law is not able to tell us which of A or not A holds if given just any A. So it contradicts the core idea of constructive logic. Of course the statement is true for many propositions in constructive logic, but it doesn't hold in general. Double negation elimination is a rule of replacement, and just as the name suggests, it means if a statement is true, then it's not the case that the statement is not true. A is equivalent to not not A, and this doesn't hold in general constructive logic. From the PAT approach that we introduced just now, it might already come clear why the lambda calculus can only represent constructive logic. To a proposition as a type exists a proof which is a term. If we have a proposition like A or B, this proof term can be used as an algorithm to reconstruct which of A or B holds. So, in conclusion, intuitionistic logic is weaker than classical logic. Each provable statement of intuitionistic logic is also provable in classical logic, but not the other way around. Many tautologies, statements that are true in every possible interpretation of classical logic, are not true in intuitionistic logic. This is the case as especially the law of excluded middle is relied on heavily in classical logic, for example in non-constructive proofs by contradiction. Because of this, we need all basic connectives in intuitionistic predicate logic. We need implication, and both and and or, and also both quantifiers, as we can't use the double negation elimination to create one from the other. So we have to define those predicates, quantifiers and operators in the lambda calculus. We start by defining unary predicates, sets. A unary predicate is a predicate consisting of only a single component. A set S gets an element X and returns true if that element is in the set and false if it is not. The proposition S without a given X just says the set S contains elements. And every element actually contained in S is a proof for that proposition. Especially in constructive logic, where a proof by contradiction might not be sufficient. In constructive logic, we need to give an element contained in S to prove that S is not empty. To express this in the lambda calculus, we construct the set S as a type, and whenever we have a member of that set, it will be a term inhabited by that type. Let's take the set of church numerals as an example. In the simply typed lambda calculus, all church numerals have the same type, alpha to alpha to alpha to alpha. So this type represents the set of church numerals. And whenever we state that a church numeral like CN has this type, we express that CN is the set of church numerals, and therefore the set of church numerals is not empty. So in conclusion, A set S is constructed as a type, and every member of the set is a term of that type. If the set is not empty, that type is inhabited. If the set is empty, the type is not inhabited. We can continue in that fashion with predicates that make a statement about an element X of set S. Such a predicate P is a proper constructor depending on a member of the set S. So P has type S to star. Such a predicate P gets a term X from a specific set S as an input. So X is a term of type S and the predicate returns a proposition as a type. So P applied to X is a type and has kind star. Such a proposition can be true. In that case, the type is inhabited. Or it can be false, in which case the type would be uninhabited. Be aware that this proper constructor P is a type depending on a term. So this construction is only possible with lambda P or systems that contain it, as we introduce types depending on terms only in that system. So in conclusion, the atomic formulas of first order logic are formed as proper constructors depending on the terms they speak about. The corresponding proposition is thus a type, which is inhabited if and only if the proposition is true. Now we come to the logical connectives, starting with the most intuitive one in the PAT context, implication. A implies B is written like this. This already looks very familiar to a construct on types that is essential in the lambda calculus, arrow types. A to B is the arrow type mapping elements of the set A to the set B. And in terms of PAT, it means if we have a proof for A, so an inhabitant of this type, 
then we also have an inhabitant for B. So a proof for B and B is true. So we can translate the implication A implies B directly into the arrow type A to B. To make the correspondence even clearer, take a look at these two rules. On the left, we have the modus ponens, which we already discussed briefly in one of the first videos. It's one of the most common inference rules of logic. On the right is the application rule from the lambda calculus. These two rules actually express the same conclusion. Modus ponens says, if A implies B and A is true, then we conclude that B is true. And the application rule says, if we have a proof M for A implies B and a proof N for A, we can apply M to N, thus yielding an inhabitant or proof of B. The main difference between these two rules is the context gamma in the application rule. The context is there to make additional assumptions about type variables being types or term variables having types. But since the rule holds for any arbitrary context, and even for the empty context, the rule is applicable in every setting, and this expresses the same conclusion as the modus ponens, which doesn't consider any context. With implication already at hand, we will not give negation its own definition per se, but rather work via this logically equivalent definition. Not A is the same as A implies bottom. But this means that we need to define absurdity in our type system. To define bottom in the lambda calculus, we look for a type which can't be inhabited. Because with propositions as types, this would mean there's no proof for bottom, which is essential in a logical system. Another property of bottom is that everything should be derivable from it. If bottom was true, then every proposition would be true. In our lambda calculus setting, this translates to if bottom was inhabited, then every proposition would be inhabited. So let's assume that there is such a type corresponding to bottom. If we found an inhabitant of bottom, we would also know an inhabitant for any type. In a constructive manner, we would therefore be able to construct a function f, which maps a proposition to an inhabitant of this proposition. Such a function would then have the type pi type alpha dot alpha. It takes a proposition, which is some type alpha, and it returns an inhabitant of this proposition, so something of type alpha. Now, let's analyze this ominous type. Assume we were able to construct such a function with this type, and apply the function to a proposition A. Applying the application rule, this f applied to A is then of type alpha, where alpha is substituted by A. This type is equivalent to just A. Therefore, f applied to A is an inhabitant of A, and A would be true. But since this holds for arbitrary types or propositions A, this would mean that we have an inhabitant for any type, and everything would be true. So, we've already found the type we're looking for. Bottom is defined as this type that takes a type and returns an inhabitant of that type. Obviously, we need lambda 2 for this construction, as polymorphism is essential in this construct. Now we can properly define negation. Not A, as in the lambda calculus, is constructed as A to bottom, which is an abbreviation of lambda x of type A dot pi type alpha dot alpha. Let's continue with conjunction and disjunction. A and B is true if and only if A is true and B is true. The classical implementation, given implication and negation, would be not A implies not B. This holds in classical logic because of the following equivalences. Not A implies not B is equivalent to not not A or not B, and by De Morgan this is the same as not not A and B. Finally, double negation elimination yields A and B. Unfortunately, this equivalence doesn't work like this in intuitionistic logic, as we can't use the double negation elimination. So we're going to use the following encoding using lambda 2. Pi type C dot A to B to C to C. Remember that the arrow type stands for implication. So for arbitrary type C, it should hold that A implies B implies C, implies C. We can prove this correspondence with a classical truth table. We need all combinations for truth values of the triple ABC. So A is true four times and false four times. In a similar fashion, we can fill out the columns of B and C. Now, A and B is only true if A is true and B is true. So only in the first two lines. An implication B implies C 
is only false if b is true and c is not. So only this line and this line have to be zero. The rest is true. Now the implication a implies b implies c is just as simple and there's only one line which is zero. And for the last implication, and so the truth value of the whole formula, we need to compare this column that we just filled out with the truth values of c. Whenever it's true for this implication, a implies b implies c, and c is false, we get a zero. Otherwise, we get a one. Now this table tells us the following. Only when a is true and b is true at the same time, the formula on the right is also true no matter the truth value of c. So we always have to look at a pair of lines where a and b have the same truth value, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, and so on. If one of a or b is false, the formula is true when proposition c is true, and false if c is false. So a and b is equivalent to, for all c, a implies b implies c implies c, since this statement is only true for any arbitrary c if a is true and b is true. We can even give an inhabitant of that type. We need to construct a term that for any arbitrary type c takes a term of type a to b to c and returns something of type c. So we need some term z which gets as an input an inhabitant of type a and an inhabitant of type b and returns something of type c. Of course this can only work if there is an inhabitant of type a and one of type b, so a and b have to be true. The disjunction works quite similarly. A or B is true if and only if A is true or B is true. It's only false if both are false. A classical equivalence using implication is not A implies B, since this is equivalent to not not A or B, which is A or B by double negation elimination. But again, this only works in classical logic. A more suited approach is the following formula. For all C, a implies C implies B implies C implies C. Let's once again convince ourselves with a truth table. First we fill out the columns of A, B and C. Then A or B is only zero if both A and B are false. Next up we have the implications A implies C and B implies C. Feel free to check these truth values by yourself. B implies C implies C is only zero on these two lines. And here's where it gets interesting. The whole formula is always true if not for the last line. Only when a, b and c are false is the whole formula false. But this means, once again, that the formula is only true for all c if a or b are true. And this proves the equivalence. Of course one could also argue the correspondence with logical equivalences or conclusions. If you're interested in such a proof, refer to Chapter 7 of Type Theory and Formal Proof by Nederpelt and Goivas. You can find that reference in the literature section. Once again, we're also going to give an inhabitant of this type whose correctness can be proven via a derivation. If A is true, so we have an inhabitant A of A, we apply X to A. Or, if B is true, and we have an inhabitant B of B, we apply Y to B. If both are true, the type has two inhabitants. Very well. By implication can be defined in terms of the already available operators, even in constructive logic, as no negation is necessary. Now the only thing we're missing to get our encoding of predicate logic working are the quantifiers. The universal quantifier was actually already defined in Lambda 2. There we introduced a notion for polymorphic types. For an arbitrary type alpha, we formed the type alpha to alpha as the type for the polymorphic identity function. So, given a set S and a proposition P, we translate the logical proposition for all X in S holds P of X into pi X of type S dot P applied to X. The existential quantifier is a bit more tricky. Again, we're given a set S and a proposition P. We can define the existential quantification with a universal quantifier and negation. Not for all X in S holds not p of x. This is equivalent to there exists x in S with not not p of x and by double negation elimination this equals there exists x in S with p of x. Unfortunately this again only works in classical logic and not in constructive logic so we need to come up with something else. 
This is the definition of the existential quantification as a type. We can translate it into for all propositions A, if we know that for all elements X in S, it holds that P of X implies A, then A holds. It's not easy to see that these two formulas are equivalent. For an in-depth analysis of its origin, we recommend TTFP chapter 7.5. So what can we do with all of this? Why encode logic into the lambda calculus? Assume you have some theorem and a proof that you claim proves the theorem. One possibility to check the correctness of your claim is to formulate the theorem as a type and the proof as a term of lambda c, the calculus of construction. Now, all we have to do is check that the proof as a term really has the theorem as its type. If that's the case, we know for sure that the given proof indeed belongs to the theorem. What makes this so appealing is that we can write a program that helps us in doing so. Now, you might argue that there's still the possibility of having a poorly written program, and you'd be right about that. But the principles of the lambda calculus are so simple that they can be implemented in a few hundred lines of code. And a program just needs to be checked and written once in a programming language that many people different understand. So, this way, the chances of getting it right are pretty good. This approach of using a program to mechanically check the correctness of a proof is used to build what is called a proof assistant or interactive theorem prover. They provide many features like an interface in which a human can work together with the machine and a language which is more readable than that of a long lambda calculus term. Besides making sure that proofs are actually correct, another feature of many theorem provers is proof automation. This means that the prover is able to find proofs on its own or it can automatically fill in intermediate steps that are tedious to do by hand. In practice, this means that mathematicians work side by side with the theorem prover to develop a proof with some parts having to be done manually, whereas other parts can be completed automatically. If you think about this for a while, this way of splitting the work between humans and computers actually makes a lot of sense. Being generally undecidable, proving things is difficult to do for most humans and computers. In some cases, it requires a lot of ingenuity and creativity to come up with a good approach, whereas in other cases, simply being able to try many different approaches leads to a solution. While humans are still better at the former, theorem provers add the capability of exploring a large part of the problem space in a very short period of time. There are many different theorem provers available now, with Koch and Isabel being the most notable ones. Koch in particular is interesting because it's built on a type system called Calculus of Inductive Constructions, which is an extension of the Calculus of Constructions, lambda c, that we explored in the last video. Koch, spelled C-O-Q, was implemented in the 1990s and was originally spelled C-O-C for Calculus of Constructions, but it was changed to C-O-Q as an indirect reference to Thierry Coquin, who together with Girard Huet developed the Calculus of Construction and later worked on the extension which was the basis for Koch as it is today. Koch has been used to provide a surveyable proof of the four-color theorem. This theorem states that for any map with arbitrary regions, no more than four colors are needed to color the regions, so that the two adjacent regions never have the same color. Surveyable proof in this case means that it's not possible for a human to check the proof by hand. If you'd like to learn more about this theorem and its history of computer-assisted proofs, we can recommend the Wikipedia page, which is quite elaborate. Koch has also been used to build a provably correct C compiler. Isabel, on the other hand, has been used to formally verify specification, development, and verification of software and hardware systems. For example, the C implementation of the Cell4 microkernel, which is a general purpose operating system kernel. It was introduced by L. Paulson in 1986 and named by him after Gérard Huet's daughter. Isabel has also been used to formalize numerous theorems from mathematics and computer science. With this little detour, we conclude the last video of this series, The Lambda Cube Unboxed. We hope we were able to pique your interest and encourage you to learn more about the Lambda Cube and its systems. If you like the theoretical explorations of this topic, we can recommend some further theory for you. The typing systems we analysed were typed a la Curry, named after Haskell Brooks Curry, whom we got to know in connection with the Curry-Howard isomorphism, for example. There is, however, a second way to type Lambda Calculi, typing a la Church, introduced by Alonzo Church, whom we know from Church Numerals. This way of typing has a different approach, and it leads to other interesting systems with a whole new area of application. 
Of course, again, on the theoretical side, there's also way more to learn about the Curry-Howard correspondence and interesting connections between lambda systems, logical systems, and type systems that give insights into one another. If you're more fascinated by the practical application of such systems, you could take a closer look at type systems used in programming languages or functional programming languages in general. If you want to explore the current state of the art using dependent types in functional programming, you may want to take a look at Idris. There's also some ongoing work of bringing dependent types to Haskell. Another domain where dependent types play a major role is theorem provers, such as the already mentioned systems Koch and Agda. The topics covered in these screencasts will get you a long way in understanding how these systems work and how to use them effectively. This concludes our short video series on the Lambda Cube. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much for watching.